Good morning. In case you don't know who I am, I'm Joe Franzi. I have the privilege of assisting today at worship. Um, Tyler is taking a much needed weekend off. Casey and Brian and Eric are going to bring us the order of worship. Craig Fry is bringing us special music. And today is the first Sunday of the month, so we will have communion, and Jerry Iamuri will be bringing us the elements. So that's who we are. I almost said we want to know who you are, so pick up the friendship pads and sign them. Can't, can't do that right now. Um, I've been asked to go over some of the announcements, and I wanted to take a minute to do that. As, I, as it's been given to me, uh, again, the tech team is requesting help, if so if you're so inclined. The food pantry. I can't tell you how important the food pantry is. I ran into John Bilsick yesterday, and he was telling me that they're up to something like 19 families and 38 people. The deacons can correct me if I'm wrong. On average, it's about four. So um, we all know that this pandemic has created a lot of different types of pandemics, not the least of which is economic, and many people are suffering. So if you have a will, please do so. Uh, Faith Acts Online. We had our first Faith Acts Online this past Thursday. It was a lot of fun. You're encouraged to check with Melinda if you haven't done so and, and, and be part of it. Um, one correction, it is listed to go through November 26th, which if memory serves me correctly is Thanksgiving. Uh, ain't happening on Thanksgiving, but it'll go the following week, which is December 3rd, so it will end December 3rd. The fall workday has been scheduled by the trustees for November 14th with the rain date of November 21st. Uh, those are some of them. And I'm going to take a moment right now to you and to those of you who will see this online. Stewardship or Pledge Sunday is two weeks from today, November 15th, 2020. Pledge cards will go out in about a week and a half. Uh, giving is down, I'm sure, for many different reasons. Uh, but giving is down, but yet the church continues to work, uh, whether it's through mission or what the office staff continues to do to support the function of the church. I would just ask that you would please prayerfully, prayerfully consider uh, your giving. And um, I can't tell you how much Jesus seems to emphasize the widow's might that she gave from her poverty and how much he seemed to love her. So take that for what it's worth to both you here and you that will see this later on online. COVID, the COVID virus, uh, it ain't gone away. Uh, I wish I could tell you that it is, and I don't think we'll have a vaccine until the new year. Um, so you need to maintain your precautions. Uh, if you're here at church, please wear your mask at all times, unless you're up here doing what I'm doing. Please try to keep six feet at distance. And when the service is over, please, please don't congregate here, go outside. The one thing I can tell you these past eight months, it's been eight months already, that seems to hold true is what I've called ventilation and proximity. We use the sanctuary because we have this very, very high ceiling. When you get outside, you've got all of God's green earth, if you will, and try to maintain your distancing. Um, this is frustrating. We have COVID fatigue. People say, where's Sunday school? Where's the church actions and so forth? But it's still happening. I've had this past week, I think I've had eight or nine positives from people we were testing. So there is a bit of a surge. So please, please, please maintain the, the safety precautions that have been recommended. We do have COVID fatigue, yet we, we believe in a God. We know we have a God who's eternal. And that's the theme for worship today, the eternal God. You know, eternity and infinity, I would suggest to you, are interchangeable. Um, if something is infinite, it has no beginning and it has no end, as, as does eternity. And man has been just fascinated with eternity for, for centuries. There is a subset of mathematics on the mathematics of infinity. Albert Einstein once said that if God is God, he can attain the speed of light, and as you approach the speed of light, time becomes incidental, as does mass. You know, the people of the Big Bang Theory, they will talk about that something obviously with great power outside of time had to come along and, and, and uh, spark the universe just in the right centigrade needed for the universe to expand at the proper, um, 
with the proper need without it exploding or imploding. Well, we Christians could have told them we already know that. Moses in Psalm 90, 90 verse 4 talks about how a thousand years in the sight of the Lord is as yesterday or a watch in the night. We have the amazing grace where it says when we've been there 10,000 years, we'll have no less time. We have perhaps one of my favorite parts of the Bible is where Jesus looks at the thief in, in the Gospel of Luke and he says to him, today, this day you will be with me in paradise. And eternity, and that thief 2,000 years ago to him just is a watch in the night. So we might be suffering eight months through COVID and we don't know how much longer we're gonna have to suffer through this pandemic, but it's just a watch in the night to God. So let us maintain our joy in eternity and having said that, would you please stand with me and read responsibly? This is from the book of Revelation, towards the end, chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's uh, great that I'm being given the honor and privilege to do some special music today because for this Presbyterian to sit and not be able to sing is truly uh, a disadvantage. So I picked a few uh, of my favorites out of the Red Hymn Book, and uh, thank you, Holly, for uh, having me be able to do this today. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord, He is the mighty King, Master of everything, His name the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name Wonderful. 
Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please pray with me. 
Father, we come to you today as one church, regardless of whether we are at home or present here. We come to worship you today as one body. Today we ask that, that you soften our hearts and, and open our ears and put into action what you have to tell us today. We often come in to this place and to worship you with our own agendas in mind. So Lord, help us be ready to listen today to what you have to share with us and to not focus on only what we want to hear. Lord, this morning we pray for the world around us. There is so much pain and conflict and division. Lord, keep us united as your children. I ask that you help us put aside our differences politically, differences in skin color, differences in opinion of how to live life during this pandemic. Lord, help us to put all those aside and focus on the unity that you want us to have. Help us to be an example to the world outside these doors and what it looks like to be unique individuals who are united for your glory. Lord, help that, pray for that example. We ask that that example attracts more people to you. Lord, we pray for our country and for the coming election, that you give our country wisdom in more than just how to vote, but also how they converse and interact with others. Lord, I pray for our country's leaders and for our future leaders, that you give them a healthy fear of you, Lord, which you tell us in the, is the beginning of wisdom. We pray for our community, our distant missions partners and our local mission. Thank you for the ministry opportunities you have provided for us as a church. And I ask that you keep us focused on the why as we continue in our ministries, on why we care for those in need and support your work, which is for the purpose of spreading the good news of your gospel. Lord, we praise you that you've provided for all of us, both as a church and as individuals. And Lord, today, help us to be generous with what you have given us. So we pray for our offering today, that it's not something that we come to just check off the box, but that it's given with a heart that depends on you and is trusting that you will use these gifts for your glory. Father, transform our hearts today. Soften our hearts and let today be the day where you form us more into the image of Christ. So as we shift our focus on your word and what you have to say to us, let us all pray how you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today, our New Testament scripture reading comes from Colossians 4, uh, Colossians 4, 3 through 6. So I would ask that you please stand while and join me as we read our passage together. Colossians 4, verses 3 through 6 says, At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. I think I have someone's sermon up here from last week. I, maybe, just maybe this one, you'll even learn something new. <laughs> um, 
Well, it is good to, to be back here in the pulpit, and I have chosen, um, we're in this series on Proverbs, and I have chosen as one of our topics that we're now going um, through for this month or so, uh, the topic of speech, you know, what we say, how we say it, what we should be saying, what we shouldn't be saying, and as I was, most of my week's work on this sermon was whittling it down to something that I could actually preach within these 30 minutes or whatever I have, because this is a huge topic in the book of Proverbs, and it's a fun one for me to, to come back to again and again. I've taught this many times in class, preached on it um, in uh, Bible study, taught on it there, because every time I come back to this topic of speech, there's something new that I even see. Uh, I see it differently. So I encourage you to, to realize what I'm doing here this morning is merely scratching the surface on this topic of speech. It is so big. And I encourage you to look through the book of Proverbs as you're able to read through it even again, see what it's saying and see how much extremely practical advice it has in this area for us today. So what I'm doing here is choosing a few of the topics on speech and trying to develop them just to get us thinking, get us to get us to think biblically um, about this. How are we speaking? Is it pleasing to God in the ways that we are speaking? And to realize how easy it is. Um, the tongue in James that we even heard about this summer is so hard to tame. No one can. How easy it is to mess up with the way we speak. And think about how much of our relating to others is through our words. Obviously, we have to consider our actions, our attitudes, but our words and our relationship and how important they are. So, to get us started, I chose a passage in Proverbs 25 that I'll read through first. And what I'll be doing is... Again, like I said, you're going to say by the end of this, wow, he did a lot of different Proverbs. It, the list was much longer to begin with, so just so you know. Um, but this one is a, a kind of extended passage that gives us some of the themes to get us started um, thinking about this. So let me read through this one. Proverbs 25, 11 to 15, it'll be. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Think about that. I'm just going to pause over each one of these in this passage. The, the right word at the right time is as beautiful and valuable as apples, apples of gold in settings of silver. Think about that. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is a wise man's rebuke to a listening ears. Or the wise reprover. The rebuke, the reproof is something that we are going to talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. Something to consider. That should be considered valuable. Like the coolness of snow, like the cold of snow in the time of harvest, is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Verse 14. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. Boasting is one of these topics that Proverbs has lots to say about. It's not one that I'm going to spend much time at all this morning thinking about, but recognize boasting and its emptiness. Finally, in this passage, verse 15, with patience, a ruler may be persuaded and a soft tongue will break a bone. The gentle or soft tongue can break a bone. Highlighting the strength and the power of our words at the end there. We have this saying that we sometimes have, for hundreds of years, I looked it up, have taught our children, sticks and stones may break my bones, but, but words will never hurt me, right? Why do we teach that to children? Well, as a defense mechanism, because we all know that words actually do hurt us. Words do matter. Words do have power. To my, to my shame, I share this story. Um, because what I should have realized long before I did is that my words have power. But I was young and naive and foolish when I was in college. And I, I remember this to this day. So this was a, um, 
This was very meaningful and very striking to me, and that's why I often share it in this context. It was when I was in college, hanging around with a bunch of guys in a college. What would we do with the guys? Well, we'd always find one of us who was usually took the brunt of it. He was the butt of the jokes. He's the one that we tended to make fun of. And I went along, and I figured, this is all in good fun. This is just, this is nothing. And then I remember to this day the, the, the time that I said one of these to this friend, one of these things that was not nice, that was mocking or making fun of, and he turned to me and looked at me in the eye and said, why are you always saying those things to me? And I was, I was, if he had punched me in the face, it wouldn't have had as much an impact as that did. Because in that moment, I realized which I should, what I should have realized long before that, you mean you actually care that I'm saying these things? You actually, that actually matters to you that I'm saying and making fun of you? I just figured it was a joke, it wasn't a big deal. But to see the power and recognize the power in our words both to hurt and to heal is what the Proverbs show us here. I was naive at that time, hopefully, and I'll share some more of my experience in this because every time I read about these, these Proverbs on speech, I again have to reflect, how am I doing in this area of my life? Because this is an area that I'm never like none of us, is going to completely tame my tongue in this lifetime. That's what God tells us. That's what James teaches us. How am I doing? Am I improving? Am I showing more and more wisdom as I read through this book on speech in the way that I'm speaking and what I'm saying to others? And this is a, you know, this is a time where each of us can reflect. The value of the good word Another proverb says, gold there is and rubies in abundance, but lips that speak knowledge are a rare jewel. Lips that speak knowledge are a rare jewel. So one thing I want to emphasize from the start is how valuable God considers our speech, how important it is to him what we are saying and why we are saying it. And do we, do we consider it that important? All right. My next Proverbs that I want to read, and we'll put them up there, are a little bit about the fool. Now, what, I, what I'm not going to do is spend all our time on the fool and what the fool looks like. We'll do these brief ones. Um, the first one in Proverbs um, 15, 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of the fools pour out folly. Another translation that I used to use gushes folly is what the mouth of the fools does. Um, getting that picture of someone who is just saying and speaking and it's just coming out. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. The characteristic of a fool is expressing his opinion without actually having the knowledge. Like I said, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is the appropriate time to invoke, um, in today's world, all the places where we can let our opinion be known. So we can do that in conversation, but we also have a, a much larger megaphone if we get on social media or um, blogging or even just sending out lots of emails to people. However, that may, may happen still. In our world of social media, there are lots and lots of opinions. But how many of those are actually based on knowledge? That's what we should be asking ourselves. And if I'm going to post, and there is this natural, just natural less of a barrier, naturally less of a barrier to posting something, to, to speaking face, face to face. So what are we posting? What are we putting on that? medium that is it folly is it just an opinion or is it based on knowledge that's something that we need to consider i'm not going to like i said dig into that very deeply i will come back and consider at the end who are we listening to because just as we are speaking and should be considering what we are saying and how we're saying it we must be wise in who we're listening to so i'll save that point for the end so instead let me turn to what we should be saying. Focus on what is the positive side of this? What is the beneficial speech? And the first one um, 
that I want to read, um, a couple Proverbs. First from Proverbs 31.26. This is the wise woman, the ideal wife at the end of the book of Proverbs. As I suggested last time, this is the end of the story. This is someone who has taken all of the wisdom in, of Proverbs and applied it to her life. Now what does she look, look like? She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. If we are to open our mouths with wisdom, we first need to know that wisdom. The teaching of kindness, kindness, gentleness, are things that you will see emphasized in the book of Proverbs, and I might come back to it, but do we value kindness and gentleness in speech as we could. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. Um, some of these proverbs reflect a royal setting that where are these written by Solomon and gathered by him in the royal courts, how do you um, maintain a friendship with the king and have influence even in the royal court? Here it's the one who is pure of heart, whose speech is gracious, and see the value that is placed on that here. As we speak, do we recognize the value of gracious speech, of kindness, of gentleness? This is especially important in the next topic that I'm going to turn to, and one that I'm going to speak to at more length, because I think it's one that we need to consider from a biblical point of view, um, and that's the rebuke. We already saw that in our first reading, that the wise man's rebuke is like an ornament of fine gold. The wise man's rebuke. Do we value when someone rebukes us, when someone corrects us, I'm going to read a couple more, uh, or one more verse, um, 2823 in introducing this. Whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. He who rebukes a man will afterwards find more favor than the one who flatters. If you think about flattery, another topic that I could delve into deeply that I'm not going to, what's flattery? It's saying nice things about something, someone else, because I want something from them then, right? We're going to talk about real encouragement. This is flattery. It's I want something, so I'm going to say something nice, and I may not mean it because it will, it will benefit me. This is showing, you know, who should I be valuing, the person who flatters me because they want something, or the friend who genuinely cares about me and is willing to rebuke me? Do we value that? This is a tough one, and that's why I want to think about it a little more deeply. The first thing I will talk about is the criticism and that I will get at the end of each semester when my students fill out their course evaluations. All right, so this is the time. They get to do it anonymously, and sometimes I read them carefully. Sometimes it's hard um, because, you know, most people, most of the students say, yeah, it was a great class, it was good, but I quickly read over those to get to the ones who didn't like what I did. And talking with my colleagues, we recognize that sometimes this is just the place for a student to vent because they don't like their grade. And they might be saying unfair things, and some of those I can set aside. Some of them are hard to set aside, especially when someone's saying something, and I say, how could they think that about me? Uh, I mean, in, in one of my classes, I remember feedback from years ago, he seemed too narrow and open to other opinions. And I'm like, I really, really try to let people express other opinions. In some places, I kind of have to be, this is what the Bible says, but I, that one bothered me. There's other, other opinions and other rebukes and correction that I've taken to heart. And I said, you know what? That student is right. I could be doing a better job. This class could be improved in that way. And, you know, I, I need to think about these papers I'm assigning and the first year I was there, I need to be more intentional and maybe, maybe sometimes less is more. That I, refer, you know, I assigned a bunch of papers and some of them said, too many papers. Well, 
my, I, I actually shared this with my boss at the time, and he said, well, you can keep giving them all those papers, and you'll be known as the guy who gives lots of papers, or you can, you know, adjust it a little bit. I'm probably still known in one of my classes as the guy who gives lots of papers, but they're a little shorter and a little more focused. And so to hear that feedback, even that critique, even that rebuke and criticism, sometimes people have things that, that can benefit us. We talk about constructive criticism, right? Constructive criticism is the key to trying to help. In our world today, criticism flies all over the place from one side to another. Um, here's one of my concerns as we look at criticism from others, maybe even, if you'll allow me, from the other side sometimes, because sometimes I hear these things said, um, I'll only briefly touch on this, but what about you know someone who criticizes the United States of America? and they say we're doing this wrong, should we label that person someone who hates the United States? I hear that done very quickly in some places by some people. To criticize America is to hate it. But wait a minute, that is not what the Bible says about criticism and rebuke and correction. Let me give you two examples. The prophet Jeremiah I, I, I feel for the prophet Jeremiah. Here is a guy who is, he's ministering in the city of Jerusalem in the years leading up to its destruction by the Babylonians where the temple is going to be destroyed, the city is going to be destroyed, the people there are going to be taken into exile. And so what is he telling the people? Uh, you better listen to God, he actually is going to judge. And the people said, no he's not. And their false prophets, Jeremiah's rival, said, no, God wouldn't judge us. He's not going to take us. And in fact, the false prophet said, the people who are already in exile, they're going to be back soon. And Jeremiah said, well, that would be great, but that's not what the Lord said. So what is Jeremiah, what happens to him? He is arrested multiple times. There are attempts on his life multiple times. Um, he is reviled be, by people. He is labeled a traitor to his, his people, because he's saying, you know what, people of Jerusalem, it would be better right now if we were already in Babylon. It would be better if we had already been defeated because then the worst would be behind us. The people who have already been taken into exile, they're in the good place. So he was labeled a traitor to his people. Was he saying those things because he hated his people? Did God say those things through him because he hated his people? No. God, through Jeremiah, was correcting, rebuking the people of Jerusalem because they wanted them to repent. They wanted them to change. And instead, Jeremiah is treated horribly as one called a traitor to his people. There's this other guy you may know, Jesus. Um, read the Gospels carefully, and he's not trying to make any friends when he speaks to the religious people of his day. He is rebuking the religious people of his day for their hypocrisy. Is that because he hated his people? No, it's because he loved them, and he again and again offered them forgiveness if they would just recognize their need for repentance. He couldn't help them, though, if they didn't recognize their need to confess their sins, to repent of their sins. And so he corrected and rebuked them and chastised them and warned them of judgment to come and they reviled him and crucified him. So be careful in our context about how we're treating criticism. There's unfair, there's lots of unfair criticism, I'm not gonna say it, but I face this whenever I've taught at times in the church. And so whenever I talk about the church, just realize I'm not picking on LPC because I've taught here, I've taught other churches, I teach at Karen, so I'm teaching the church very broadly. So I, I, I'm not trying to pick on any anyone in particular, but I feel this as I sometimes in my teaching raise criticisms of the church today, right? And the reaction is, what are you doing? That's what the people out there are saying about us. So if I'm standing here saying the same thing as the people out there, I'm siding with the enemy, right? But those of us who stand up here, stand up here at a pulpit, open God's word, and are to be teaching God's people, we have a responsibility. 
God's word itself should be correcting us and chastising us and training us. We have to be able to hear those rebukes that may overlap some of the criticism that we get from outside. And that may hurt, but if we care about our testimony, are we going to take some of those criticisms? I mean, just to, to be honest, one of the biggest criticisms that we get as a church, again, broadly, is that we are hypocrites. That's what the world would say about us. We're hypocrites. And the easy answer is, no, we're not. They're wrong. The harder process is to say, why do they think that about us? And in some ways, they might be unfair in the way they're judging us. I'm not denying that, but maybe there's something to those criticisms. Maybe we need to think a little bit harder and examine ourselves. Why would they label us hypocrites? Are we and can we be hypocritical? The answer is certainly we can be because we are still sinners. But that type, that's hard to accept at times unless we see the value of that type of, again, constructive criticism. Are we willing to take it? All right. One place that I hear criticism from and correction and rebuke. I shared my course evaluations. I'll share another. Um, I have been over the past 20 years, occasionally, I'll, I'll leave it at that, occasionally rebuked by my wife. Why? Because I deserve it. And she, why, is, why do I identify her? Because she is the one that I have the closest relationship with. She is the one that sees me most clearly. And so how does that work? And so in one area that overlaps, um, how do I correct my children? All right. I let them know in no uncertain terms when they have done something wrong that they are absolutely wrong and they better straighten up. Sometimes the way that that has come out has been judged especially harsh, the way that that will come out. You know, you can picture my kids, especially when they're little, cute little Anna, and I'm telling her. So, at times, my wife, Jody, has come to me and said, you know, I, I know you needed to correct, you know, one of, the, one of the kids. In the way that you did that, do you think you were a little too harsh? My obvious immediate answer was no, I was not too harsh. That's exactly what they deserved, right? Upon further reflection, though, many times, over 20 years or 16 years since we've had the kids, um, you know what, you're right. Sometimes I have been too harsh. And even going then and talking to that whichever child it was again and saying, you know, I, you know, I, I needed to say some of those things, but I apologize for, for, for speaking to you to so harshly, I didn't need to do that. That that's the type of correction that I need because that's where I can error, error with my, with my tongue, with my mouth. And so I appreciate that. And in the moment, I don't like it, right? None of us likes that in the moment when someone says, what you're doing, wasn't that wrong? Wasn't that too much? Wasn't that? But that is something I appreciate that I have, um, that Jody has been willing to do that because that's not easy. It would be easier for her at times to let things go, right? And that's what we all need to look at. When, when do we need to speak up? When do we need to say, you know what? Is that right, what you're doing, what you're saying in, in this topic of speech? Are we willing to correct and rebuke because we care about someone so much? And that's the picture that we're getting here. Because we care, are we willing to do that? The other side of what we should be saying, a little more positive side, the, um, the, the encouraging words, the healing words, the gracious words. So let me um, read through a couple more, a few more para, uh, sorry, proverbs up there, beginning with 1218. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. Words can hurt, we know that. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. We have the power to hurt with our words, but we also have the power to heal and encourage. Look at this next one. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Um, the tree of life is a, a favorite topic of mine in the Bible. If you don't realize this, the tree of life makes an appearance in Genesis 2 and 3, 
And at the end of chapter 3, Adam and Eve are sent out of the garden and they're denied access to the tree of life, right? The tree of life appears again. We're talking about the new heavens and new earth. We were reading about it earlier. In Genesis, sorry, in Revelation then 22, the tree of life makes another appearance where it is there for the healing of the nations. So the tree of life, both at the beginning and the end of the Bible, is pictured as this tree that gives life and healing, and it appears nowhere else in the Bible, except it's mentioned a few times in the book of Proverbs. Look at what is considered the tree of life in verse 4 up there. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. And that's Proverbs 15.4 is the chapter, if you want to see it. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. Do we recognize, and this is my, my emphasis, how valuable that is, how powerful it is when we use that gentle speech that I mentioned before, but I even want to emphasize here. Do we value those who speak gently? Again, in our world, it's, who yells the loudest? Who's saying things most harshly that gets people's attention? Are we being wise and discerning and recognizing that the gentle tongue has so much value and is so powerful that here it's called the tree of life that can bring healing and life? 1523, to make an apt answer is a joy to a man and a word in season, how good it is. So that, as I mentioned before, that right word at the right time. Do we consider our words that so carefully that we're saying, I want to say just the right thing here? That's the challenge that we're given by the book of Proverbs. A couple more things I want to touch on. Um, Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. All right, so fewer words are better. The heart, the next verse there, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. We've all heard this, right? Ponders how to answer is thinking before we speak. It's that simple, but do we remember that? Because in the moment, we want to say, we want to speak, we want to respond. Do we ponder and consider? Do we show that restraint? The last thing that I want to talk about is the implications of this. It's not just about who, what we are saying, it's who we're listening to. So the last verse, I, verses I want to read from Proverbs 22 verses 17 and 18. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you if all of them are ready on your lips. Hear the words of the wise. Are we listening to those who are wise? So if you will allow me, I haven't talked about it yet, I will do my application here in a timely manner the fact that we have an election this week. Are we listening to the wise? Don't worry, I'm not going to pick sides. What are people telling us about this election? Who are we listening to? Let me make some statements here. If we think that the fate or the future of the kingdom of God depends on the outcome of this week's election, we're not thinking wisely or biblically. We think that the outcome of this election, uh, the future of the kingdom of God, and make sure you see what I said, the United States of America is not equivalent to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, if we think that we need one of these two presidential candidates to prevail in order for God to accomplish his purposes in our country through the church, the body of Christ, we are not thinking wisely or biblically. We, the church, the body of Christ, will continue to carry out our mission in this world no matter who wins the election this week. If we think that either candidate, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, is our savior or deliverer, we are not thinking biblically. 
Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. As Christians, we owe him our highest allegiance. As Christians, in him we must trust and put our faith. His kingdom will prevail and endure forever, long after both of the political parties today are cast into oblivion with the passing of time or the coming of our Lord. And the United States comes around. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, will endure forever. And if we have forgotten that in the craziness even of this election season, that this must happen or that must happen for, for the world to go on, we are not thinking biblically. And who are we listening to if they're telling us that is really what I, what I want us to think about. If people are telling us that, that is not wisdom. That is not the Bible. That is not what God would say to us. So do we need at times to be tuning out some of the voices that are having a real influence on us and focus on what God says, because it's very different in a very different priority and a very different outcome. Are we being discerning and wise in the way that we use our words and who we're listening to? That is the challenge that I bring to you from the book of Proverbs this morning. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to prepare our hearts to celebrate um, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you have saved us, that you have called us to be your people, that you have brought us together as your body, the body of, the, of Christ in the church. And I thank you for your grace in our lives. Um, I pray that you would help us to show that grace to others, that we would be a gracious people who show love and kindness and gentleness even when we need to rebuke. I pray that we would take these teachings of your word this morning and apply them to our hearts and might your Holy Spirit apply them so that we might give more honor and glory to your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Look full in his wonderful 
Beloved, this is the joyful feast of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Scripture teaches us that believers will gather around this table. They will come from the north and the south and the east and the west and will gather at this table where Jesus Christ is truly present. Everyone who confesses Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, every baptized person who trusts in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and for their salvation is welcome at this table. Let us join now in a word of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not followed you closely. We have not fulfilled the requirements that you have put before us in leading a life that honors you. Heavenly Father, forgive us for our sins. Heavenly Father, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, we claim the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, the one who died on the cross to forgive our sins. Lord, we claim that blood and ask humbly for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon this table so that the bread we break and the cup we bless will be for us a communion in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. With Christ, in Christ, through Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen. The night on which our Savior was betrayed, he took bread as I do ministering in his name. And after giving thanks for the bread, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Let's partake together. In the same way, after supper was concluded, our Savior took the cup. He poured it out and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink ye all of it. This cup is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ until he comes again in glory. Beloved, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, you have nourished us with this spiritual meal. And we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit in such a way that our words might be apt, our behavior might bring you glory and honor, and that all that we say and do would be a witness to people to the life lived in Jesus Christ, so that all may come and know you and love you and serve you and follow you forever. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Come, Emmanuel. 
And now as we go forth from this place, let us go forth in peace, have courage, hold fast to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let all the people of God say amen.